Well, hello and welcome to this presentation of Secrets of Successful Families. Today, we're gonna to consider what makes families successful. That is, what are a few core things that successful families do that allow them to thrive and bless future generations with wealth, values, and a sense of group identity. Today's presentation is brought to you by Covenant Trust, the preferred financial provider for Covenant Living Communities. And my name is Brandon Hovey. I am a financial services representative for Covenant Trust, serving Covenant Living of Turlock and Northern California. Okay, well, let's dive in with three secrets of successful families. First, successful families play the long game. Now, if you've been watching the news or tracking the stock market, you surely know that the coronavirus has created this downward trend in the stock market. We're currently experiencing extreme market volatility where things are bouncing up and down seemingly every day. And in the face of that, what a lot of people want to know, perhaps what you want to know, is what do I do with my IRA, with my 401k, with my taxable investment account? That is, how do we invest wisely when there is extreme market volatility? Well, first, successful families make sure that they have a well-diversified portfolio. You don't want your retirement account, your core investments to be wrapped up in two or three blue chip stocks. That creates what's called a concentration risk. Instead, what you want is a well diversified portfolio that has the appropriate mix of mutual funds, uh, high grade bonds, most likely uh, a little bit of international emerging market uh, mutual funds as well. Uh, these are the type of portfolios that we build for clients at Covenant Trust. Uh, unique portfolios that are calibrated to their unique life situation. Now, assuming that your investments are in a well-diversified portfolio, the best thing you can do is to play the long game. It's to leave your money in the market and to see this through. Let me show you an example of why this is the case from history. Here on the screen, you'll notice a 120 year tracking period of the S&P Composite Index, an index of the 500 largest companies in the United States. And as you look at this graph here, you'll notice that there have been periods of recession. There have been periods of regression in the stock market for these 500 companies. The blue vertical lines show these periods and the thicker these lines are, the longer that regression or recession lasted. So for example, in 1929 and to 1939, we had the Great Depression, which created a downward trend in the stock market. Similarly, the Korean War and the Vietnam War uh, brought about downward trends in the market. Uh, the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 that we all remember very well affected uh, all of our retirement accounts in a significant way before it snapped back. And if we were to extend this out, we would probably say here in 2020, COVID-19 uh, has uh, also created um, a financial crisis and a recession as well. But what I want you to notice is that although there have been ups and downs in the market, and although some of these are corresponded with uh, different world events, the gold smoothing line that runs across the screen shows you the average of the stock market. It shows you which direction it goes. And over this period, it consistently goes up so that over 120 years, there was an approximate 11 percent annualized return on investment in the S&P Composite Index here on the screen. If you had a well diversified portfolio during these years, you would have experienced a gain of approximately seven to eight uh, percent on your account per year. So the principle here, the big idea is that when it comes to our investments, when it comes to our 401ks and IRAs and investment accounts, we need to play the long game. We need to have a well diversified portfolio and to see it through knowing that eventually things will snap back. Let me show you one more example of why we need to play the long game. If you had $10,000, uh, let's say your grandma gave you $10,000, you invested it in the S&P 500 in December of 2004 and you left that money in the market for 15 years. You didn't take anything out. You didn't put anything in for 15 years. In 2019, that $10,000 would have turned into $36,418. In other words, you would have had an annualized return of 9%. Not bad. In fact, that's very, very good. However, if you tried to time the market, 
if you pulled some money out because you got nervous and then put some money back in and you miss just the best 10 days of the market, you see on the screen here that your return would have been cut in half. Your $36,000 would have turned into $18,358 and your return on investment would have gone from 9% to 4.13%. Similarly, if you miss the best 30 days of the market, you would have actually lost money. You would have had a negative return and only come back with $8,150. So again, this illustrates why it's so important to keep our money in the market, to have a long-term strategy in a well-diversified portfolio. Now, the second thing successful families do relates to what they leave to their loved ones. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 22, it says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Now, the principle here is that if you are able, if you have the means and the resources, it is a good thing, is it an admirable thing to leave an inheritance to your grandchildren, to, to leave money, to leave property, to leave whatever you can, and to care for one's family. In biblical times, this was done in a certain way. It was done through the family farm. The family farm was something that was a source of food, sustenance, and shelter for an entire family, an extended family. Uh, it provided um, a lifeline for these families. And when the patriarch and matriarch of the family passed away, that farm was given to their descendants. And then it was passed on and on through the family line. It was an inheritance for one's children's children. Nowadays, however, if you had a family farm and you gave it or left it to your children, what do you think would happen? Well, most likely for many of our families, our children would sell that family farm immediately and probably spend that money over the course of their lifetimes. Things have changed. We live in a different world, and so we want to be intentional about how we think about what we leave to our loved ones. I think this begins by asking questions like how much is enough, how much is too much, and have we prepared our children and beneficiaries for what they will someday inherit? See, money can be not just a blessing, it can also be a curse. And the Vanderbilt story tells us this. Cornelius Vanderbilt was one of the richest men who ever lived. He was wildly wealthy. Uh, the Bill Gates of his day and age in the 19th century, he built his fortune on the railroad and shipping industries. And although he was good at making money, uh, he did not prepare his family very well for the wealth that they would someday inherit. And after he passed away, he left nearly everything to his family, and it created all kinds of family drama, uh, all kinds of uh, infighting in the family. And 96 years after he passed, they had their first family reunion. Imagine, 96 years. They had their first family reunion. It was at Vanderbilt University, and there were 120 people present. And out of that bunch, there was not one single millionaire left in the room. So all of this fortune, all of this wealth that was acquired by Cornelius Vanderbilt had evaporated in just a few short generations. According to William K. Vanderbilt, the grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt, he says, it has left me with nothing to hope for, nothing definite to seek or strive for. Inherited wealth is a real handicap to happiness. Now, we do not want inherited wealth to be a handicap to the happiness of our children or grandchildren. So it's very important that we govern our family well. This is what successful families do. They govern their family well so that wealth is a blessing and not a curse. Now, successful families are also interested in passing along non-financial assets. And they do this by asking key questions like, who do we want to be as a family? What are we trying to accomplish? When should we start? Why do we care? How will we get there? They begin asking these clarifying questions about their vision as a family. And a great place to start relates to having a mission, vision, and values. Now, one way to do this is to have a family mission statement. A family mission statement is simply uh, the purpose, goals, and standards of a family. And one brilliant idea that a lot of families have is they gather together and they begin to write out on paper a family mission statement that's reviewed by the family every single year. And in this family mission statement, they answer questions like, what are the personal or family stories that we want to pass on? Where did we come from? What's our genealogy? How do we arrive in this country? What are notable ancestors that we want to make sure that we uh, learn from and remember? 
uh, or uh, what are the important things that we want to uh, tell future generations? What's the advice that we want to pass on and leave along? Is there a faith tradition? Uh, are there specific values or a family business uh, that we want to make sure is passed on down the line? These are all great things to capture, great things for our descendants to know. But unless we are intentional, uh, unless we find specific ways to pass that along, uh, there's a chance it will be lost. So writing it out on a piece of paper, reviewing it with our family so that they have things to discuss around the campfire, things to discuss around the dinner table that relate to our family uh, is a brilliant place to start. The other thing that is smart to have uh, that successful families have is their last wishes in an estate plan, in a will or a trust. Uh, a will is a crucial document that everyone should have. Uh, it has the ability uh, to capture uh, where our uh, assets go when we pass. If we have children um, under uh, the age of 18, it has the ability uh, to assign guardianship uh, to them. We can also be charitable and tithe our will uh, so that our uh, descendants see what our values and priorities in life were. You know, will is a very personal document. It's, it's autobiographical in nature. And a lot of times it's the very last thing uh, that was in a sense written from you that your ancestors and that your descendants will read. So we wanna make sure that these documents are in place, uh, that they capture our values uh, and wishes uh, and um, that they are there for our loved ones. In the book of Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14, it says, For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. Now, when it comes to victory in our life, having advisors, having experts to help us navigate crucial decisions is invaluable. We need advisors, we need experts, and this is exactly what successful families have. Now, successful families build the right team. This is the final point. There's many areas in life where a DIY approach works very well. If you're fixing up your car, fixing up your home, and you know how to do it, doing it yourself can save you a lot of money. However, if you're gonna have open heart surgery, probably not the best idea. Similarly, when it comes to investment management, having experts in your corner, having expert advice is invaluable. There's been many studies like the one on the screen that show the problems with DIY investing. The vast majority of DIY investors, do-it-yourself investors are missing key asset plans, don't have an overall portfolio plan, make sector bets with little knowledge, do not factor in tax management, and are not aware of hidden cost that often comes up when it comes to investing. So teamwork is needed. Successful families build a team of advisors around them in core areas such as investment management, estate planning, taxes and accounting, pastoral advising if you're a person of faith, and legal advice. It's very important to have input and advice in these core areas and to build a team of professionals that you trust and who are willing to talk to one another to create synergy in terms of your overall family plan. I would also mention here that when it comes to investment management, I highly recommend considering a fiduciary. While many investment shops can do the right thing, only fiduciaries have to do the right thing. Only fiduciaries have a legal responsibility under the law to put the best interest of their client first. Uh, they are held to a higher standard than other investment shops. And whether you choose Covenant Trust, who's a fiduciary, or another company who's a fiduciary, if you are considering uh, going somewhere for investment management, moving uh, money, I would highly recommend uh, looking for a fiduciary. So to wrap up, successful families pass along their wealth and values in at least three ways. The first thing they do is they play the long game. They build a well-diversified portfolio that's meant to ride the highs and lows of the market, and they provide for their family and favorite causes. Second, successful families govern their family well. They use an estate plan, wills and trust, to guide and pass along assets. They pass along their family history, vision, and values by creating a family mission statement that's discussed around the dinner table and engaged throughout the year. Finally, successful families build the right team of advisors. They find women and men that they can trust, that they believe in, and then they partner with those experts in core areas of life so that they can have a plan 
to pass along their wealth and values to the next generation. If you have any questions about the material reviewed today or questions on other topics, please feel free to reach out to us. Covenant Trust Financial Services representatives work with families and institutions throughout the United States. To find a representative near you, please visit covenant.com.